everyone. Welcome to Climate Exchange. Uh, today, we would like to welcome Martin Berg. Uh, Martin is a globally renowned leader in climate and environmental finance, and he has conceptualized and led low carbon investments in the public and private sectors for more than 20 years. Prior to working at Polynation, Martin worked at the European Investment Bank, where he was the head of the Environmental Fund and Climate Finance Policy Unit. Uh, as usual, the session will last for about an hour. We will start with a presentation by Martin, followed with a short Q&A session. So you can type your questions on the chat throughout the session, and then we'll get to them during the Q&A at the end. Uh, this session will be recorded. And yeah, I think that's all. Thank you for being here, Martin. The floor yeah. is yours. Thank you for, for having me. I'm trying to let me see whether I can do this. So share my screen here. So now the typical Zoom question, can you see this? Can you hear me? Yeah? We can, yes. Perfect, that's good. So yeah, so hello everybody. I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. Um, so my name is Martin Berg. I'm, um, yeah, I'm, I'm working now for a company which I will introduce in a second, HSBC Pollination Climate Asset Management, but just to, maybe just as a, as a bit of a background. So I've been I've been doing different environmental investments now for yeah for more than twenty years, um, both both in the in the public and also in the on the private side, um, and also kind of started off more on the on the on the climate side, uh, and then over the last years of the European Investment Bank really got, got also in the in the natural capital space, which and we'll discuss it in a minute. It's really in my view uh, really also it's it's well it's an, it's a problem but on its own or or an issue or an opportunity um, on its own, but it is also obviously a huge piece of the puzzle to, um, to solve the climate uh, problem. So I, yeah, I was the last 10 years at the EIB and last year in June, I joined Pollination as a partner. I was a bit longer involved actually already um, since, since the beginning of the year in discussions. Um, and uh, yeah, when we formed the joint venture with HSBC, I moved over. So I'm now actually working for um, HSBC Pollination Climate Asset Management. Maybe we should kind of lift a little bit and give a bit of more background just to, because they, I, I, at least we, we get a lot of um, feedback that people are confused who's pollination, is the uh, HSBC pollination, what is it actually? So just, uh, so what we are, we are we are joint venture of HSBC Global Asset Management. I don't think that really needs to too much um, uh, introduction. So that's the asset management arm of, uh, of HSBC and pollination. And this is where Casper is working. So Casper and I are kind of sort of colleagues, but not really colleagues because we're actually working in two separate companies. Um, sorry, Martin, sorry to interrupt. Maybe you could put it in presenter view so that we don't see the grids. Oh, sure. Sorry. I thought it was on there. So is this better? Uh, no, now we're seeing the whole uh, presenter view, as in how you. Oh, would so see if you it. go to um, display settings, top left, there's a drop down bar. Uh, sorry, what? Dis uh, you, display settings on the one next to that. Yeah. And then I think if you, yeah. Uh, swap, swap presenter view, that, that hit that button. There we go, right? Yeah, perfect. perfect. Thank you. Excellent. So, great. Well, that was still easy to see, I think, right? It's a big picture, so, <laughs> so it's going to be good. maybe actually Casper to make it more interactive. Do you want to introduce a bit like uh, what is actually pollination? You probably have, you know I have, I have the two the, oops, the two uh, slides. Uh, uh, and... I, I haven't prepped anything, so I'm doing this slightly off the cuff. But um, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, some of you have have heard or read a bit about pollination. Um, as Martin said, there are there's HSBC Pollination Climate Asset Management, which is a joint venture with, between um, two companies. And uh, there's also Pollination Group, which is a separate entity entirely. Um, I guess there are three elements to it. There's the advisory side. So we're very similar to uh, kind of strategy consultancy. Um, we advise solely on climate uh, and ESG. Uh, we focus our efforts uh, on sort of seven sectors, largely at the moment working with finance. Um, and that's the kind of the advisory side. It's originally founded in Australia in 20, I think 2019. Uh, and what started as a conversation around a kitchen table between our two founders has now grown to a company of about 70, uh, both in Sydney and Australia, uh, London, and also in, in Washington and kind of Chicago spread around the States on the East Coast. So there are three teams now. Uh, I joined at the beginning of January. Um, that's the advisory side. There's also an investment part within pollination itself, so separate to HSBC. Uh, and they are in the process of fundraising for a number of different funds. Um, 
looking to accelerate the transition through the deployment of, of finance. And then finally, there's a third element, which is the foundation, more philanthropic side, more um, kind of policy focused side. Uh, they're Australia based uh, at the moment, and they're sort of going through the process of, of launching um, as we speak. So the power of three, I guess, the whole purpose of it is to accelerate the transition to a net zero climate resilient future. Um, we have a very diverse team. I did the masters with um, that you guys were on last year. Before that, I was in the military for six years. So I've come from a completely different uh, career entirely, but I did so because I perceived climate change to be a, a more significant threat than any of the kind of social, socioeconomic political threats that we are facing. Um, uh, we have a number of largely mostly lawyers in the Australian office, uh, investment professionals, uh, consultants, uh, and a number of my colleagues have kind of come from CDP, EY and PwC. So a very big, diverse range of, of individuals, but all of us are kind of focused on that one goal. So um, in comparison to your McKinsey's and your, your BCG's who offer a wide range of services, um, and within that they kind of specialise in, in certain areas, we have a very specialist focus, but in order to achieve that focus, we provide a wide range of, of kind of um, services to do so. So uh, I, hopefully that's, that's given you a a brief introduction. This is a great introduction. Maybe just to, to just to add on on that. So I think the difference between in my mind, at least, between pollination and let's say BCG and McKinsey is is really well. Well, there, there are two things. One is really this 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 focus on net zero. So it's an unencumbered firm where where pollination is new. So there's no there's no legacy, right? There's no issue that the you know, somebody advised some cool projects quite recently, and that kind of uh, kind of undermines the entire mission of that. So this is this is very uh, this, there is a mission driven um, philosophy behind behind the company. Everybody who's worked on that worked actually almost the entire career on on on, on these type of issues, and, and we believe that's really important also to be credible in front of clients. So that's a one big difference in my mind, and the other one is really that there is this. Um, the real drive to build out in the investment side as well, which I think makes pollination very different compared to, let's say, one of the more classical advisory firms. That's why I joined it. That's why I thought pollination was really interesting, at least from, from, from my background. And the two, the one big theme um, is that Casper just mentioned is the transition finance. Uh, that's that's something that the colleagues within pollination are still working on. And then the other big theme was, was natural capital or is still natural capital. But we kind of took this out of um, out of pollination and formed this into, into the journey. And that's really was what, what I was really keen on, on, uh, on, on working on because I, I, I came from um, yeah, being really more public background. I thought this was ripe to go a bit more mainstream and, and that there was a good market opening um, to, to actually build this out. I think I would have never expected if you now had asked me, I joined less than a year ago in June, if you had asked me that I would sit here now, not even a year later and saying we formed a joint venture with with HSBC, I think when I signed my contract, I would have never expected that. And actually the discussion with HSBC started just after I signed my contract, but it was still in my, my gardening leave. And um, it was interesting because they, 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 the pitch to HSBC initially was much broader. It was really also on, on other subjects and they picked out the natural capital theme and they said that we believe that's really a differentiating factor. And um, I wasn't aware how much HSBC is actually doing on natural capital. If you look this up a bit, it's quite amazing actually on the, they're working with Cambridge, they're doing a lot of philanthropic things, they're financing studies. Um, they actually have some good in, of their own research in this area. So it's actually, if, if you're interested in that stuff, I think that's a good starting, starting point to do that. But what actually, so what this joint venture was, it started really with a discussion in, um, uh, in, in March last year, um, where the two parties really hit it off and, uh, and the CEO in the end of uh, HSBC Asset Management said, look, what I want you guys to do is to really come up with a proposal how we can scale natural capital. And, um, and that's what we did. I mean, I remember we worked the entire Easter weekend frantically to kind of bring this, uh, um, basically have the, have the pitch ready for, for a presentation after Easter. We, we, we presented it to them and they were actually very happy. And the other kind of really interesting, uh, maybe um, uh, story behind is like, uh, I hardly have met anybody in HSBC in person, I think. Uh, and that's really the other kind of interesting thing when you think now on COVID, this, this thing was entirely negotiated on Zoom, which in, in a way, was, I, I would argue also brought some efficiency because um, as you can imagine this in the end, because it was an equity investment by HSBC into this joint venture, uh, required some additional fundraising from the pollination side in order to, to finance this, this new company. So it required some high, high level um, approvals in particular on the HSBC side, all, all the way up to the, 
um, to the top of the bank. And uh, and those type of, um, I mean, it was actually relatively straightforward because uh, a lot of the calls were happening very early in the morning. I remember that, but it was possible to get all the senior people very quickly and uh, and, and actually uh, in, in, in one room, it was a Zoom room, but we got them in there. And, and I think that would have never happened in, in real life because I think it would have meant, well, those are meetings that have to be done in person. Uh, and then you probably say, well, but you know, this and he or she is, is only available in three or four weeks because it's traveling around the world. So that, I think there's, it's, it's maybe, it's, it's to have some positive story around the whole, the whole COVID situation we're in now there, you know, in some, in some instances, at least to, to, to some efficiency. So what is HSBC Climate Asset Management? We call it CAM for short. It will very brief, very soon come out with a, with a new logo which kind of brings the climate asset management much more in the forefront because we do realize that with HSC coordination, it is a bit confusing in the market. So very soon you will see a much more branded climate asset management and then it's in partnership with HSBC and pollination. The idea is really to create an, an asset management firm entirely focused on natural capital. And, and that was really the thesis or that's the thesis behind the company that that's missing in the market at the, at the moment that um, the SAI asset managers are also deal in the space and we'll kind of define it in a minute a little bit, but um, there's no one who's really um, trying to bring, combine kind of the, the impact that natural capital brings with a return seeking strategy um, and also bring some scale to the market because that's one of the, the key key elements that's, uh, that's missing. And, and it was a really, it was a, it's a really good match because as I said, HSBC has been doing um, um, a lot of work already on natural capital, identifying this as a big theme for for, for their client interaction on the sustainability side. Um, that, and and uh, but that what they needed is really to have to work with a partner that could bring this in and bring and also bring the expertise in to really make a, a very tangible investment proposition out there. So, um, so the, the the combination of the of, of the two um, kind of led them to this new company. Where we stand is we are working on two strategies. I will describe them a little bit later, just to kind of finish the presentation to see where what we're actually doing um, and then um, we, are, we have to do a lot of regulatory things so an asset management firm will be regulated uh, in the UK so there's obviously a lot of things that have to be done on, on that front before we, we can really get ready to, to then also um, officially launch the funds but I wanted to kind of start a little bit more Jasmine and I think that's that's what now, Celia, but you asked me to just make, talk a bit more on natural capital. I understand you discussing a lot here about, about um, climate change more in general, so maybe not as natural capital. But I think for us, what, what's really important is, is to bring the message down. It's like, now, as you can see here, nature is really part of the solution to address climate change. So that's one of the things that why, why we really think that um, uh, nature has a play to, uh, has a part to play. Um, in the whole discussion on climate change, but it's also a standalone issue. Uh, we, um, and obviously, we, we are also losing an um, enormous amount of species at the same time. Um, but overall, um, the, when, you, when you think about removal or, or reversing, so to, so to speak, the, the, the trend of climate, we, we cannot only mitigate, we also need to remove CO2. You can do it, I mean, I, I understood last week you you discuss climate uh, and carbon capture storage, uh, CCS and probably CCU. That's probably one of the solutions as well, but actually nature is a great, is a, is a great way to actually do it. And we do believe you can also do it in a, in a, uh, a profitable way. And, and why is that? Because there are quite a few drivers, um, both macroeconomic drivers, but also um, on the regulatory side that really support nature as an investment theme. One is really population growth, it's, it continues. So we, is in the bit more population growth, we will we will need more food in addition to more energy and, and all the other things, but it will put an additional strain on our process how we actually um, get food to, to everybody, and that is that is actually an um, in, in, in interesting growth driver for for this uh, kind of uh, investment segment. And then we're seeing there's so many new rules regulation that are just looming. We have, uh, the, you probably may have seen the Descriptor review that is kind of setting now a framework um, for, um, for, you know, for analyzing basically what the issue is 
um, and, 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 and why nature is not really properly priced at the moment. It doesn't really give all the solutions, but I think it, it provides a nice framework in the same way the Stern report did that. Um, so there are many people thinking, okay, how long does it take from um, uh, from the sculptor to a Paris moment for biodiversity and nature. And maybe we can discuss that later, but there's definitely a lot of expectations that that will lead to something. And we already see it on the risk side. So there's a task force on nature related financial disclosure, which is, which is being discussed, which will hopefully be launched next year. Um, and, and many, many observers think, okay, this could actually lead to a similar situation. What we've seen on climate with the task force on climate related disclosures, which, but I can say this from my own experience at the ERB, that really, in my mind, got things moving. The moment you have the risk people on your side in an organization, things change. It's not, it's no longer a side issue any longer. The moment you have your chief risk officer convinced this is a problem, things are starting to move. And that's what we're seeing now on, on, on the climate side. So um, what we need to do is really on, uh, uh, on let's say, on, on our nature side is really uh, we need to transform a problem into an opportunity. Left side here really shows uh, like where we're going wrong. Firstly, um, land use change, forestry, agriculture are really a massive contributor to, to global greenhouse gases. It's often overlooked, but this is often we're focusing so much on energy or energy related emissions. So that's, that's really one. Um, and, and you see we're in the wrong, the, the, the cycle goes the wrong way, right? We are, um, we are we are using more, um, we're relying more on chemicals, soil degradation is increasing, we're seeing more biodiversity loss, um, that leads to water contamination, and that kind of then, then also leads to climate change over there. We're a bit of in a vicious circle since 1970, this has been significantly um, increased. Um, you've probably seen all the, the pretty devastating numbers on, on the biodiversity loss. So what we really need is to do the opposite. And that's what you really see on the right side. And this is really where natural capital can, can play um, um, a, a really in, a, in, 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 in an amazing role, right? So um, uh, we, uh, the, the moment we increase biodiversity, reduce uh, chemicals, we have a chance to enhance the soils. Um, we're getting more resilient production on the ground and we're improving water quality, which then goes back and increases biodiversity. So we, we're seeing that actually there is a big driver to, 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 um, to, to focus actually on natural solutions, not only because it, 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 it uh, um, uh, let's say it, it, it prevents the, uh, more and more nature loss, but also because more and more people are seeing that it actually makes sense. Also, when you look at agriculture, if you look, use less chemicals, it's less costly, if you enhance your soil, um, it's becoming more resilient. You you have to spend less on uh, on 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 these uh, on, on uh, when a disaster hits. So those are all things that really um, going in there. And, and um, so in the end, so this is this is really where um, where where we see that natural capital can can really drive drive value. So just to kind of I mean this kind of went through here. That you see a little bit the drivers that we're seeing on the one hand side. It's really a macro um, um, opportunity. Um, with more inflation, population growth, the demographic change, and, and, and really a scarcity of, uh, of land, there's, there's really an opportunity to, for, for investment. And at the same time, um, we see the regulatory drivers that actually enhance um, um, the same kind of um, um, value drivers. Um, so regulatory change, probably in particular on the carbon markets, but we see it also now in, when, you, when you look at the UK, you look at also uh, on, on new markets such as biodiversity. Um, huge driver for also um, been, uh, changing, changing the way we build, which, which again has a, has a huge driver for, for, um, for timber. Um, and then generally again, and, and, and a higher focus on, on, on health and, and wellness. So what is then um, natural capital investing? And so you know, there's a lot of discussion, is natural capital asset class, is it an investment theme? Um, and I think it's important to say that um, natural capital touches nearly half of our GDP. So it's actually everywhere. And so unsurprisingly, it's not necessarily an own asset class. It's actually a theme that is easily integrated in all different types of um, investment opportunities. And maybe from bonds, could, could be done through green bonds. Uh, there are they're, they're, um, asset managers that offer equity products and relate to that. Um, um, but also in particular on the real asset and commodity side. Um, so it is, it is something that is easily integrated in, uh, into investment strategies. And, um, uh, and that's often something that's also, 
I think it's, it's a little bit of a framing um, that, that is required vis-a-vis -vis investors. I mean, it's, it's, it's a little bit with what happened on climate as well. Only when people really started to look through their portfolios um, uh, and, and, and their supply chains did they realize how much they were actually dependent on, on climate-related risks, for example. And the same we see on nature here. I think it, it, there's just an unawareness of, of uh, the importance of, uh, uh, of nature for um, for, for, for many investors. So um, and where we sit really, um, it, is an, it is, we look through this really from a more real asset um, um, opportunity. So um, the funds or the, the strategies that, uh, that Campbell promote are really um, um, more in that, in that space. So you see it here. So with real assets, we, what we mean is really direct investments on the ground. And then you come easily to agriculture, to forestry, but also to other natural um, um, uh, capital related uh, projects. The way we kind of look at this is you have, um, you have a lot of agriculture where you have an opportunity to um, improve things through let's say regenerative agriculture um, through, through, um, through more sustainable techniques, which, which then also allow you to, to actually get a better yield and a higher value. The same in, on the forest side, but also there's a lot of opportunity now to look more and more on projects that rely much more heavily on, on things like payment for ecosystem services. So we're, we're looking, I think the one question that was mentioned is the reef credits. I'm not sure whether reef credits are, we, we can discuss it maybe later are already there, but those are the type of ideas where, where I think on the regulatory side, there's an, there's an, there's an opportunity with, with, with very little, um, let's say changes. I think regulators could actually um, have a huge influence on, on how this type of projects could, could be financed. Um, from a from a market positioning, so where we really saw a gap, um, for particularly for one of our products, is really that we they, they are already obviously investment. I said half of the GDP is dependent on on natural capital, so of course there are already investors active in this. But what we really saw and is that what was really a gap is to really take the national capital as investment theme for real assets and. Um, um, and really, and, and really bring this to to the mainstream and and, and scale it because you you have on the one hand side you have a lot of smaller funds that that are doing that actually really interesting strategies often using some blended finance or they're they also um, have a more philanthropic approach, um, but what we see is that the scalability on on a lot of those funds are just not there and institutional investors that that say well I need to write at least a hundred million ticket or uh, at least fifty million tickets they actually struggle to find a home for this type of money in this type of strategy. And then you see at the other side, you see mainstream agriculture and forestry um, funds that are, that are also now, I mean, they're, they're all focused now on ESG. I think a lot of them are also now looking into the natural capital, but in the end, they're more traditionally focused um, um, funds that um, that don't put the, 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 uh, the impact there. So from, from our perspective, there was really an opportunity to, to for a large scale investment vehicle that is not saying we're an agri fund or we're a forestry fund, but this is saying, look, what we're trying to do is here to changing landscapes, to improve things and, and really return impact with, um, uh, with return and doing it at a, at, at a size that is not in the market there. Um, so, what is it what we're actually offering? Um, so we have two products out on the market. So one is uh, what you see there on the left side is a natural capital product. That was pretty much what I just um, explained. It's really an, an, an investment opportunity for large scale institutional investors, such as insurance companies, pension funds, or maybe some, some other long term investors. And, 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 and what it is, is really offering investors and, 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 and access to to the combination of return, impact, and scale. So with that product, what we're doing is we are, um, with the majority of the, of the, of the um, funds, we will go into agriculture and forestry projects. For us, it's really agriculture means then, and, and, and this, is, this, this is where this focus on landscapes comes in. We, we, we always go in a project and we want to basically improve something. So for, for us, when we, when we go in a project, we look, we look for a combination of, um, can we achieve a return on the one hand side, but also, is this something where we can achieve an impact uh, and, and bring this then to the, to the next level? We, we have our own impact tool that is, um, that is assessing that both ex ante and ex post, and it's, it's quite important for us, uh, for us to do that. And then what's different really for, let's say, in, in, in forestry and agriculture fund is that we were saying to the investors, look, you get a very traditional 
strategy in, in some sense, it's agriculture and forestry, but we're, we're trying to take it from a, from a different level. Um, firstly, there's the, the impact focus, so there's really um, um, the improvement, but that actually also leads to, um, um, in, in especially the agriculture way, it actually, um, if, if, if you have a longer time horizon, in, in this case, we're, we're looking at 15 years, it really allows you to, um, to change practices um, and, then, and then over time also increase the yield, which is then also good for your return. So it's a really nice example how you can combine a higher return also with, the, uh, with, with, with an higher impact. And on top of that, and that's what a lot of in, investors find interesting, this strategy also allows at least some exposure to carbon, to biodiversity, some, some other new asset classes that may not be 100% there yet, but over time it's, it's conceivable in the 15 year time that with more regulatory and voluntary pressure, there are actually new opportunities which actually could give the overall strategy an uplift. So it's really, it's really something where, um, um, and, and that's really what we think is new there, that it combines this, um, uh, this, this scale, so the ability to write large tickets, but also that it, that it brings forestry and agriculture out of uh, out of their own corner into this um, in, in, into um, into an, an investment proposition, which which um, allows to achieve the impact, but also have a bit of more kind of almost like a call option on on regulatory changes, if you will. So if if you look at the one hand side, as in let's say your insurance companies and you, and you hold a lot of long term investments into fossil fuel companies, which are very diff difficult to get out to, then you have here a product that actually will increase in value if the environmental regulation moves in the same way, and and that can be seen as an offset. And that's really what we're um, what we're trying to to offer to to these investors. So that's one product. On the other product, we're also seeing there's a um, there's a big focus in particular from corporates at the moment on net zero targets. Um, we see that a lot of companies, even if they're having a very good um, net zero, let's say, strategy, um, that they still always have a residual amount, which is very difficult to evade. Um, there's obviously a lot of discussion in the market whether this should be offset using offsets, but uh, the reality is that we're seeing as a lot of the companies, especially the one with the, um, with the very um, large um, um, net zero targets, that they are actually facing facing quite significant shortfalls. At the same time, there are a lot of companies that are that are looking at this, um, and this is this is the same regulatory driver that I mentioned earlier. That they're saying, well, there is actually um, uh, there's a, there's a, a, a very good likelihood that carbon pricing will come in some form, and that would like to get ready. And so, this carbon solution strategy is really allowing investors to provide upfront financing to projects to generate high quality or to, to support high impact um, carbon projects in the area of um, nature-based solutions. So we're looking at Red Plus, we're looking at mangroves, we're looking at wetlands, we're looking also in some of the newer, newer techniques such as um, we have a, uh, um, it's called savannah burning carbon farming projects where actually some indigenous techniques are used in order to um, to, to reduce emissions by burning in a controlled way some of the savannas and then really reducing the risk of, um, of, of wildfire. So th this is the type of projects that, that we are, that we are um, anticipating to, to finance with, uh, with this fund. And here it's really, it's a very different investment proposition. It's really to say to the investors, look, carbon pricing um, has, a, has a good chance to go up. We can't obviously tell you exactly what will happen, but um, um, if you're worried that that the, that the carbon prices in five or ten years time may be significantly higher than today, then it makes sense now for you to invest into projects that can actually generate carbon, um, and that um, uh, and and that then these carbon credits can be used uh, in, in in the future. So it's, it's de facto almost like a price hedge for for um, for future price increases in carbon. If you do this, I mean, you could do this in many projects. You could do this in renewable energy projects, but we. We really believe that nature-based solutions offers a, a great opportunity. A because almost all um, governments that are looking at the moment in different forms of carbon markets, they are, they can probably agree on one thing: if companies should use offsets, then they should probably come from removal credits. Um, and um, um, you probably heard how expensive CCS uh, last week. There's some other techniques, but the the the, the removal credits on the, on the more technological solutions are either 
I would argue, untested or extremely expensive. So let's say here's, an, here's an, an opportunity where actually the costs are relatively low. And in addition to that, there's huge impacts, impacts on biodiversity, impacts on local communities that are very really, uh, positive and structured in the right way can actually lead to to win-win situation. So we believe it's, an, it's, an, it's, it's, it's a good credit type to support. Um, it allows it hopefully a little bit of what we call regulatory optionality, maybe also vis-a-vis -vis in, in, in Article Six under the Paris Agreement, which which may or may not emerge, um, and and so it's an it's an it's a product really where investors are not doing this for a return, but actually to receive carbon credits um, for their investments. So Celia, maybe I'll leave it here, and I'd be very happy to answer questions. Yes, thank you, Martin. Um, we have a lot of questions. Uh, Luke, do you want to start? Can you speak? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure my question actually makes that much sense now because I was thinking that they'd be public investment vehicles, but Phoebe's informed me that they're, they're not. They'll be private. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, absolutely. So we're looking for private investors. Uh, basically, sure. I need to stop sharing, right? Let me just... Um, ah, okay, thank you. Now I, now I get it. Yes, but they are. Okay. Is there any plan to make them into public investment vehicles in a few years or no, would that never? By public, you mean like listed? Yeah. Well, it's a little bit like, I mean, you, you have to compare to infrastructure. You obviously at some point you could list, uh, you can list infrastructure that are listed infrastructure projects. It is probably something that with the maturity of the market and, uh, and more project, those, those things are all possible. But even on the infrastructure side, I think, um, I mean, you, you, it, it is still a more physical uh, or real asset product in general than, than let's say, say other things. But on natural capital, I mean, if you look for listed or private products, I mean, there are some asset managers that offer actually some interesting strategies. One of them, for example, um, is offering an, um, an in growth equity strategy for listed smaller companies that are, that are, that are focused on natural capital or on the circular bioeconomy. And they actually make a really nice case how they select the, the underlying um, uh, investments in these listed companies. And, and they're quite successful. I think they, they raised more than half a, half a billion of that. Sure, thanks. Um, I think Lucy, you're next. Thank you. Actually, Martin, it'd be nice to know which company that was, the, the, the fund that you just mentioned. That's uh, Lombard Odi. Oh, Lombard Odi, okay, cool. Um, actually, my question is also, in terms of the future and, and development of capital markets in this area. But do you think there would be a case where you would get SEC and FCA regulating for improved disclosure and maybe scope one, two and three uh, biodiversity impact disclosure, uh, you know, maybe through CDP in, in the future? And therefore, that would stimulate the development of, um, you know, sustainability, well, uh, biodiversity, sustainability linked bonds. And also, presumably, you could then create many more products, um, listed and unlisted, on 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 that basis. No, absolutely. I'm I'm not sure whether whether yeah that type of regulation would come quickly. But may, like, so I think the most likely scenario for me is really that um, the, the, that the whole nature discussion follows a little bit the climate discussion, so that there is some some form of voluntary or encouragement to look into the risks related to nature, right? They, I mentioned this um, earlier, there's a whole process to, to launch a task force on nature related financial disclosures, which very much should follow the, the task force on climate related financial disclosures. So the idea is really to, to make companies aware that there are risks that are also related to nature. I think the big question is how, how this could actually be integrated in the TCFD process, but that's probably a complete separate discussion, but I think the risk lens is always kind of the first step for doing this. And I think you saw this probably a lot on the climate side as well. The moment the companies focus on, on, on the risk, they will also look at the opportunities. And then I think they will look a lot more also in what other products they can, um, uh, they can launch. And also I think you will see that the, um, the more companies in this, this, there's a huge shift now also on assets from, from well, let's say uh, higher, or higher, carbon, um, higher carbon content uh, investments into, into lower carbon content uh, investment, right? So, and, and in that process, you will see an enormous amount of opportunities and to actually 
um, create new products. And uh, what we need more probably on the on the nature side is also really good investment cases that there is really enough of a stock of an underlying investments so that then they can be taken to the next level. Thank you. Um, Anika, I think you have two questions. Do you want to ask them now? Yeah, I'll combine them. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, so my first question was, um, how how do you position the natural capital investment approach uh, compared to ESG? If I look at most of the bank's websites, I no tend to note that they're always a little bit separate. Is there a specific reason on why it makes sense to position them separately or why would you combine them? And the second question, sorry, I'll just drop it then you have. Um, was you mentioned um, natural capital projects that are part of this of the CAM solution suite. I just wanted to ask what type of organizations initiate and run those? Mm. On the ESG versus natural capital. So I mean, the ESG is kind of the, the starting point in a way. I mean, ESG is setting for you frame. It kind of puts red lines in the ground, if you will, what you can do, what what but but that's it really, right? So um, and and, and obviously there's a big focus now on, on the investment side on that. I think when you look at, in general, I mean, we're actually saying generally an impact investment, right? So the impact side is the next step from, from ESG. And then it depends a little bit on what type of investment segment you are. And we can also, the this, this same what I'm saying is now applies for social investments as well. The, the ESG side is only saying we, we shall not do certain things, like we shall not have child labor, we shall not uh, um, uh, use certain techniques, but it doesn't really help you to measure um, uh, the, the underlying um, outcomes of, uh, of that investment. Um, the, there is obviously assumed that there is a positive effect, probably most of the ESG criteria that are being used actually are leading that. Not all of them, I would argue, but, but most of them actually do. And so I think when the moment you go into more an investment uh, in an impact approach, you really have to start also measuring what you're actually doing and integrating it in the investment process. And I, I think that's the reason why it's really separated, right? So, and, and ESG investing is, is, is really more much bigger umbrella in my mind than natural capital. Natural capital is so much more specific than um, in, in, in investment theme in the same way you have other impact themes, right? It can be, can be climate or it can be, as I said, some social, um, it could be women empowerment, for example. There are, there are uh, funds around that as well. Right? So, and um, and you know, I said ESG the starting point, and then you need to okay, if I want to have a strategy that's focused on that, how do I actually measure that, and how do I ensure that I use this as part of the investment strategy? And I think what we try to be different is that we're saying we don't just want to have this as a reporting tool in the end, and saying there is an improvement as an aftermath, but we actually want to integrate it into the investment thesis from day one and actually see it also as a value driver. And um, who's doing this on, on natural capital projects? I mean, a lot of them are still relatively small scale. Um, so there are a lot, of, a lot of them come also out of the, either the public side, the philanthropic side, or a combination of that. Um, and um, what we see now a lot, for example, we are, we are working actually a lot now with um, NGOs, uh, with public authorities, with uh, think tanks to find ways how we can capture some of the um, additional revenue streams. And I think that a lot of them are really now run. In the UK, there's, there's, there's quite a bit now on, on, on biodiversity. There are a lot of public or semi-public authorities that are working then, they're working with water companies. So it, it's, it's a mix, right? But very often I think what, and in and, and my, my previous job by, at the ERB, we ran something which was called the National Capital Climate um, uh, Facility, which was an, an, an EU-wide um, facility to find bankable projects for natural capital. So we really went out, we had some EU money to allow us to take a bit more risks. And we also had money for project preparation. And, What's really, I think, what the 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 the, the, or the, the key difficulty at the moment and the, and the projects is to actually put those projects together. Often, it's 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 you need somebody who actually pays for that, um, that there is somebody who 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 brings all the parties together, um, and then often it actually works out really nicely. And uh, and and that facility, I think, the most successful project this facility has done is where they actually could use some of that. They had some project preparation money where they used that in a, in a good way to then actually present a bank of a project. And I spoke today to a consultant of a bank, bank who exactly does that as well. They're basically paid to do that. And I think those are actually at the moment um, some of the most important, um, let's say, players because they're kind of helping 
to, to really work this out with the underlying, often the project owner is some municipal or some other local entity to then, then really finding the appropriate investors to that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Martin. Uh, Oli, do you want to ask, ask your question? Yeah, um, thanks. And thanks for the talk. It was, um, it was really interesting. I was just wondering if you've come across any um, sort of conflicts with sustainability as a wider um, as a wider concept in sort of like if there's local people who are exploiting the land or deforesting an area to further their own development um, as a local community, whether that's something that comes into conflict with with what you're doing or in terms of um, the assets uh, and things like that. I mean, it might be completely irrelevant, but um, I was, yeah, I was just wondering if that's sort of come up. Well, I mean, look, we are, we are looking for situations where we can improve something. Um, we will work in partnership um, because we are an asset management firm, so we can't implement all the projects ourselves. So we usually look for partners that are aligned and that actually want to change something. And <coughs> frankly, for us, it's important also to be able to control the landscape because we think that's actually the way you, you have an ability to, to change something. Because if you, for example, lease uh, uh, like a leasing model, gets you only that far. So that's, that's I think, how we would approach it. But I'm, I'm not, I mean, it cuts both ways, right? There may also be criticism that then um, by doing this, that some some people who kind of, I don't know, either lived there or, or had their um, economic livelihood there are being in, in, in a way displaced. And I think that's obviously, that's always a challenge in this area. And this is a big challenge in, uh, in natural capital, probably not as much for the natural capital strategy we are looking for because we are mainly focusing on developed markets so on Australia, New Zealand, um, um, Europe and, and North America, which is best, 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 much more straightforward to actually buy land. But it's, it, is a, it is an issue, right? So the moment, so the moment you, you get into this, these, these discussions there become important. And when you, when you think about the type of projects we are trying to do through our carbon fund, where, where you're saying, well, you may have a projects where people are getting paid for, uh, uh, to protect the forest rather than to, to cut it down, then you obviously always get into this into these discussions, right? So I, I uh, worked on, on quite a few projects be, be before I joined where, where you had projects, where we had local communities that then still went in there and, and cut down the trees and it could even lead to, to social tension because you have different interests there. And, and that's something you have to manage and how communities are involved is probably one of the most challenging aspects of these projects. So it's a, it's a very relevant question, right? And you. And you have to find good ways and stakeholder engagement in order in order to do that, and and also you have to really make sure that there's an economic benefit flowing down to to local communities. Otherwise, it's really not not very credible, right? And and then then it can really lead to problems. Well, thank you. That's um really interesting. And Asta, do you want to ask a question? Uh, yes. Thank you for the talk. Uh, my a uh, question, maybe you kind of covered this, but I just wanted to clarify that you currently, are you just selling your products as an offset solution or are they also, for example, a nature-based adaptation solution for, for example, insurance companies or whether mm -hmm. other ways you... Yeah, we have a cheap product, right? So those are investment products for different type of investors. One is really more guided to companies that, that uh, want to basically generate offsets and the other one is really more for companies that want to have an investment product whereby they probably, I mean, they, the, the resilience part is, is playing also a big role there, right? So I think that's one of the strength of the investment strategy by improving landscapes, by, by uh, using um, different techniques, the resiliences are really supported and that's also attractive for, for, for some companies, but it's really an investment led approach. So I would say the one is an investment led approach that tries to achieve a, achieve a return and impact at the same time. And the other one is really more in, um, a solution for corporates that really have a need to, to procure carbon credits. Oh uh, yeah, and then on the offset, I wanted to ask that, have you come to this kind of, I guess, uh, a moral dilemma that a company just wants to offset but doesn't want to mitigate, and then they're using this to do like a greenwashing strategy almost that we are seeing net zero, but then they're not actually uh, mitigating at all. Sure, no, and, and it's, an, it's, it's a relevant, point right so it's um i mean um we we advocate to anybody who wants to do that that they should really first focus on on own action um so and 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 that's really i think if you if you read any report or any guidance i think the 
um, the Institutional Investors Group on Climate Change just came out last week and they kind of made the same point. They actually said stay away from it, but if you can't, um, and, and, and they admitted some cannot because there's always some residual emissions, then, then go for, um, uh, for high quality or for removal credits. And I think that's exactly what we're advocating as why well. That was one of my arguments for actually using nature-based solutions as an as a, as a credit type, but I think it, it should be the last resort. On the other hand, if we really want to get to net zero, um, um, it is it is properly required. I think we have to see that the, the a lot of the companies, um, even if they're managing the supply chains very carefully, will always have emissions. So there, there will be a requirement for it. Thank you. But Martin, is it worth talking briefly about the task force for scaling the voluntary carbon markets to lend just to explain a bit more about the sort of improvement in accuracy and, and quality of, of carbon offsets. No, I mean, can talk about it a little bit. So, um, uh, so there's, there's obviously, like one of the, the, the underlying challenges of the, of the, uh, at the moment of the carbon market, that there is no carbon market, right? It's an, it's an fragmented um, regional voluntary, sometimes national schemes uh, that work extremely different. And for companies that saying, actually, even if you want to do the right thing, and even if you want to procure um, high quality credits, it's actually quite challenging to navigate this. And the, the task was for scaling uh, the voluntary carbon market, which is uh, led by Mark Carney. Um, and then I think also Bill Gates is supporting it. They're, they're really um, focusing, they're probably focusing more on the market infrastructure. I think that's probably also one of the criticisms that some observers have been made that it's probably they what they what they really look for is a definition of what is a suitable carbon credit to be used for offsetting and how can that be how can more uh, liquidity be um, um, created in the in, in the market and a lot of I think a lot of focus is on uh, on on those elements in uh, um, uh, of this task force. So actually, if, if you're interested in the subject, I think they presented a really nice report. Also, McKinsey on the back of that um, made a really nice study on uh, on, on uh, nature, climate change, carbon credits. Uh, those are all publicly available. I think you can Google them them uh, quite easily. And and they really, I think they outline quite nicely the the issue. I think the the one thing to be to be discussed, with, as I said, with the with the task forces, but what's really the problem is there. It's, it's a problem really that we don't have a liquid market instrument or it's a problem that we actually don't have enough supply or, or, or not enough agreement on, 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 on what standard should be used. And I think the task was, I mean, they're the, the continuing, the, the work is continuing, but I think the, the task force still has to kind of uh, make up, I think, or come to, to conclusive uh, recommendations. I don't know if you see it, Kasper, how do you see it, Casper? Exactly the same as that. And um, McKinsey did produce a good report. Trove is also worth having a look at um, just to understand what proportion of the, the carbon market is uh, sort of low quality offsets, which are heavily kind of providing huge supply, which is then lowering the price of the really good quality offsets that exist within the market. So those who are taking the steps to bring uh, afforestation kind of drawdown um, carbon offsets to the market, they're not getting the price which is fair uh, because there is so much the supply of the kind of the lower quality offsets. So it's delineating between the two um, and that's something that they're trying to do. And, and I think we're absolutely in favour of that. And I mean, I read today an article that there's still some credits floating around from uh, from the joint implementation uh, uh, mechanism under the Kyoto Protocol, which were found in some New Zealand registries that uh, unclear how they actually want to deliver them, but they're still selling them for very low prices. And I think this is this is unfortunate because it really just discredits the market. I think if we, we could create now a forward-looking carbon market that that really tries to um, uh, focus on high-quality projects, then I think that's a real legit way of uh, of addressing the climate problem. I had um, one of the observations I think for that question just there is, which is, do you find that some companies want to just achieve carbon neutrality by buying a shit ton of carbon offsets and then calling themselves carbon neutral? And the answer is yes. Largely companies which we speak to, and we do get asked that quite often. And as Martin said, the first thing is always to recommend, you know, what changes can be made um, to reduce emissions or, or improve energy efficiency. And um, the kind of the hard, hardest to abate industries are the ones who will always ask that question first. And the real difficulty is selling to them uh, sort of what steps they can take 
um, and showing them what other benefits are accessible if they have a good strategy in place. So yes, you could design a, a carbon offset strategy, but it should be part of a wider decarbonisation strategy where they can then access you know, improved finance um, in the form of debt or, or equity or loans, et cetera, um, and basically presenting them with a carrot and saying this is what you can access if you were to produce this strategy, uh, rather than simply waiting for regulation, i.e. the stick to come, in, come into play. Um, so it's a really interesting place to be working at the moment, especially when you get those when you get asked those incredibly tough questions by people who have read something about carbon offsets. They don't quite understand. You know, we get asked now, what does GHD stand for? Um, so it's a really good challenge to try and address and as well as try and pitch. So um, yeah good space to be to be working in sorry I'll, I'll let Felix ask some questions I jumped in there took up some of you got your guys time there is Casper that was really interesting uh Alex has a really cool question I hope your answer is well <laughs> you want to you ask yeah. a question thanks thanks Alex. and um thank you Martin for a fascinating talk and also Casper and Climate Exchange for setting it up so my question is on the uh blue carbon economy which just seems to be mentioned a little bit less when we talk about natural capital I was just wondering um, like how many investable opportunities you see out there. I guess I've heard of mangroves, but is there anything else? Um, and you mentioned like project preparation. What, how much work do you need to put in on that side to make things sort of scalable in the investment, investment side you were talking about? Yeah, sure. I think, um, yeah, I think the, the, on, on the blue side, I think the, the mangroves is probably the, the easiest example for, for anyone to, to grasp. And, and also, because we have some methodologies for that. I think there's, there's obviously a lot of potential on, on in general in the blue economy or um, uh, ocean related investments. Um, but for one, one aspect I would say, well, one project that is this really emerging is uh, uh, seagrass or kelp. So this is really kind of now planting um, seagrass and uh, the different types that, that you can plant and they have huge potential to absorb CO2 but also do a lot of good on for the biodiversity underwater. So I think there, there are some opportunities. I think the trouble at the moment from a pure investment perspective is that a lot of the, they, they are very little methodologies to really understand what the real impact are and in particular in the, in the, CO, in the CO2 mitigation. Um, if we knew that, then it would be much easier to also put the financing around that. So I think they will be relying much more on either now, let's say, quite, um, well, in, in, let's say, more angel type of investors that were really going into early opportunities or also in a lot of kind of public money to really demonstrate that, well, first to, to really develop the methodologies, but then also to demonstrate that. But there, I, I, I do believe that this is, this, there, there are some, some good opportunities there. Um, that that could be developed. Obviously, it's it's at the moment it's more straightforward to do this other than agriculture, and particularly in forestry. Thanks. So you're not invest, investing in wells. <laughs> Sorry, Andy. In in wells. In wells. Wells is in like a borehole, or whales is in. No, the fish or mammal. Oh, investing in whales. <laughs> yeah. Um. I would add, I mean, one of the things, just elaborate on what uh, Martin was saying, it's not so much about whales as such, but uh, there's a great model, which I found previously, when I, actually when I was on the Masters, which demonstrates that SDG 14, which I think is like Life Below Water, is the least invested in, in terms of all of the, the, the 17 SDGs. And yet it's probably the most talked about in terms of David Attenborough, the BBC, doing an awful lot of documentaries around this space. And it's just because there isn't that, as Martin said, that kind of investable pipeline of projects available at the moment. And some of the work which Pollination is doing largely in Australia because of the connection of the Great Barrier Reef is, is understanding how can you commercialize seaweed or kelp? And what what uh, other co-benefits can it have? And as Martin said, nature-based solutions in comparison to a kind of a hard infrastructure project like a coastal defense, it has a number of other co-benefits as well. So actually the value is increased, not necessarily monetarily, but um, in terms of benefits of, and, and resilience that's created on, in, in the water and, and around the, the coasts themselves. Um, but uh, pollination kind of exploring how can you, how can seaweed filter um, nitrates and phosphates which have been pumped into the sort of the river estuaries uh, from um, agriculture, whilst also then drawing down carbon, how can you then extract that, kind of capture the carbon, 
generate an extra revenue stream through through captured carbon as, as well? Um, and then what can you do with the byproduct? Is there a kind of a circular model which you can introduce there? And it's something which they're working quite closely with the universities in Australia on. So it's a really interesting space, as Martin said, and, and I think it's also one um, which will, will prove um, very kind of lucrative in the future. Um, it, when you're thinking, and it would be interesting to hear what Martin's opinion on, on this is, but in terms of the land, sorry, the global, the earth being 70% water, you know, land in terms of what you can do and grow and so forth is, is finite, has hard borders. And there's an awful lot of potential to draw down carbon and do other, try and utilize the ocean as best as possible. Um, once once we've forested as much as we can and, and you know, um, implemented as, as much uh, nature-based solutions as we can um, on the land. So it's yeah room for expansion yeah and the, i mean you could you could do a lot i mean i again in my my prior life at the eib we try to do a lot on the ocean it is it is quite challenging to build business models around especially when you go to so we, we try to do some 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 um, projects but basically you paid fishermen not to fish in a certain area, and it's extremely difficult to actually administer that. And you have to find very special situations that we can do that. But I mean, and 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 and, and this is this is one of the one of the key challenges. So in the end, the biggest opportunity that I think that most people land on is aquaculture. You can argue whether this is really a political solution or whether it's uh, even sustainable. It's about lots of different ways. That I think some also project of language that actually. An interesting combination, but still, it's 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 um it's it is a bit more challenging to develop this as an investment theme than let's say some of the more land based ones, and it's also more difficult as a government to put regulation in, for example. That, that's that's an, that's another one. I think I would argue it's probably easier to do, let's say, in, in a biodiversity net gain or an offset requirement uh, than than to do something similar on the on the ocean side, just because of the, the way. The, the oceans, uh, um, in, the, in the way you can monitor it, the way the laws work, and, 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 and so on. Um, Martin, would you have another five or 10 minutes? Because we still have a few questions, or should we wrap it up now? Uh, it's absolutely fine. OK. Um, Guy, do you want to ask your question? Are you still here? Yeah, I'm still here. Thank you. Thanks, Felix. And uh, thank you, Martin and Casper, for the talk this evening. And thank you to Climate Exchange. Um, I wanted to ask what challenges you see with the implementation of TNFD, uh, given that we've barely implemented TCFD yet. Yeah, I guess that's that's the biggest challenge that you, that you have there, right? So I think when you think about it, it I, I think TCFD was a huge success because it really focused a lot of companies now on climate that uh, before said that's not our problem, and and I think what the whole campaign on unburnable carbon and the the impacts on the certain valuations has shown is that. Um, that is not true. Uh, financial firms are actually exposed and the transition risk, if you really think this through, they could be quite dramatic and any risk management that looked at that uh, uh, probably is, is coming around to that. So that means also that, and, and, and it's, as you say, it's, it, it's not really implemented. And I think there's a bit of a fatigue in a way almost of the organizations or a bit of a nervousness of saying, oh, can we haven't even been able to fully, to start even to integrate this into our system. Now you're coming already with the next thing. Um, and I think that will be the biggest challenge, right? How can you, how can you connect it to TCFD as much as you can? How can you make sure that this is not something completely different, um, that it actually maybe it's just an add-on or that it, that, it, that it does things that is really in addition to what under, is, uh, what is already done under TCFD. So that's, that's I think, um, structurally, that's, that, that will be a big challenge. And then the other one is really, they are now, the process is now running to find, so to speak, a sponsor and a home for this. And I think that will also be, the other big challenge, I think, it will be very important to find the right organization and hopefully one or two figureheads that can really push this through because then it could really get to this prominence that is required. I think the combination of F FSB and Mark Carney were quite powerful um, because there were not people that coming from the climate side that really said, look, you ought to look at this and we strongly recommend you to do this. Um, and, and then being Mark Carney, the, the person he, he is also being, being very public about it, I think that really helped, that gave, that gave the subject a lot of credibility and you probably would have to have something similar on the nature side. Cool, thank you. Maybe, maybe Martin, uh, Martin Berg and TNFD would be a good... Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> I can definitely say no. <laughs> um, Benjamin, do you, want, do you want to ask a question? Sure, thank you, Martin. 
Um, I was just interested to hear a little bit uh, about your thoughts on the future of um, markets for biodiversity offsetting and biodiversity credits. Well, I think, um, I, I hope that this is something that, well, firstly, I think this is this notion that this expectation, this could be similar to carbon. And I think it's probably much more, it's probably a little bit more difficult to administer because it, it really is a more, it tends to be more regional schemes, but I think this is also offering the opportunity that on a regional level, there's actually, there are opportunities to, to implement this. So what we're seeing in all the other biodiversity offset schemes that have been tried are usually within, I don't know, the same watershed or within the same region. And basically the basic concept is the same. If you, if you have to build something on a high biodiversity area, then you have to replace it. Um, and I think that is actually something that that, um, uh, that can work. I think we have to continue with, with also with infrastructure projects, um, and um, they in, in, inevitably have a, have a have a negative footprint on the environment by then having the opportunities to actually either um, regenerate areas, convert um, areas. I think it's a, it's a huge opportunity to actually then 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 maintain the biodiversity. So on, from the market side, I think. What you need to probably look out for is not necessarily one global scheme or in the, the Convention on Biodiversity, but they have now, in, I think in October, their the, the 15th, 15th uh, meeting. And I, I think you will get a, a global kind of, you know, this, you, there won't be a focus on a global carbon price, but I think that would be maybe a focus on more has to be done. And then governments have an opportunity to actually implement this on a, on a local level. I think the UK is, is very well placed. I think there are lots of ideas that are, that are coming out now um, and as, as part of the, the review after exiting the, uh, the EU. And, and, and I hope that there are some, some good mechanisms that really allow them also to, uh, to finance, uh, to, to basically convert a lot of the subsidies that were in the agriculture in the European um, agriculture uh, system that you actually can use that to really and, and enhance biodiversity and, and, uh, and market mechanism can play a good role there. Thank you. Um, Rafa, you're next. Super quick, yes, uh, thank you, Martin. Can you explain us a little bit more about your pipeline and, and how do you source land projects? Yeah, so um, pipeline for the for the natural capital strategy, um, as I said, a developed market. So it's um, um, so we, we look at projects in Australia. We're looking at some projects in Iberia now, um, and also the US. And uh, what we're looking at is, for example, conversion of bare land to to olive uh, plantations, sustainable olive plantations, with some additional cover on the ground. That's, for example, one. We're looking in the US at um, sustainable forestry operations that are embedded in a conservation easement. Conservation easement is when um, a governmental or semi-governmental organization is actually paying that this land is dedicated for conservation. So you can still have a working forest on it and you can still take from time to time some wood out of it and, and manage it sustainably, but you can't really cut it down. Or most importantly, but but they try to prevent this that the hotel is being built or mall is being built on on, uh, on on that land. And and so that that's those are good opportunities. And, and then Australia actually um, offers, uh, uh, what we find interesting in Australia is there are lots of um, regional schemes in regard to carbon, but also now in the, to biodiversity. I think the reef credits is, for example, one idea that is that is now emerging, whether this is something that still has to develop, but that's something we are looking at. But also on the agriculture side, there are good opportunities to, to um, again, it's, it's, it's similar, often bare land or, or land is not necessarily used in the in, in the right way and and then by going more sustainable in particular in Australia with the climatic conditions is also increasing the underlying resilience of the projects which is then also attractive from a from a return perspective so those are the type of projects we're looking at we're sourcing this mainly through through partners um, through our, our own network so we are trying to develop um, relationships with partners on the ground that can do one more more than project especially on the agriculture side that's important because they're they tend to be um, a little bit smaller, that there has to be an aggregation play. So for example, in the project in, in, in Europe that we're looking at, that's exactly what we're doing. We're starting with one smaller project, but with the vision to really enlarge that um, partnership quite substantially. So those are the, this is this is the way we're working on the carbon side. It's very similar. I think we're sourcing through our own network, but then always rely on, on partners to, for the implementation. And there we are also working a lot with um, let's say semi-governmental organizations, NGOs, think tanks, um, because we believe it's an, um, it, it helps us really to identify projects where also the stakeholder management is done in an appropriate way. And, and, and we think in emerging market, that's quite important. 
Um, okay, we have we have another three questions, but I think Anlo's and, and Kalin's we can we can sort of merge them. Um, do you want to ask it, Anlo? Um, yes, thank you, Martin, for the talk. Um, I was wondering how are you assessing the impacts of natural capital projects related to agriculture, and do you think it will be possible to scale up long-term agricultural investments in developing countries in the near future? Um, and if I can just add, um, what what role of um, data would play in, in that process? Sorry, I, I missed the last one. Um, what role the data would play in that process? Yeah, so I, I think so. The, the way we're looking at, at the impact side is really that um, we we're doing a well. Every time we, we're we're looking at a project, we're doing a preliminary data assessment to see where does this where does this project actually stand and where do we want to get to. Um, and um, what intervention is possible um, in, an, in a return seeking strategy uh, in order to com combine the both. And, and it's kind of finding the right sweet spot between something which is perhaps too degraded in order to enter and something that's already actually there. So that's, that's really what we, are, what we are looking for for projects. Um, we're doing different types of um, uh, measurements in the agriculture. So there's a lot of water related uh, measurement indicators, soil related indicators, also how the land is used, whether um, uh, where it is so and and that's kind of where we are collecting that with the survey and then um, from from there we kind of do our own assessment we, we do a point scoring system that that um, um, that allows us then to score that project in in order to to see where we stand at the beginning and then we will do the same type of scoring over time and and uh, uh, and, and, and monitor what was the, with the other question felix i fortunately Kalen, uh, do you want to ask it now? Oh, on the um, well, it's, 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 it's oh, data, yeah. yeah, sure. Sorry, on the last, um, lower than the last. Scale. Yes, of course. When you have very large scale projects, right, emerging markets, when you look, uh, it depends. For example, how you see Brazil. I think the largest agriculture projects you can see in the world are in Brazil, right? and like they um, and. Um, and there, obviously, there's a huge um, opportunity to also go into more sustainable practices. There are actually quite a few initiatives there to to. Um, to have some financial incentives for farmers to go more sustainable, and um, and that's definitely uh, something that uh, that we all should focus on. Thank you, Daniel. Do you want do you want to ask a question? Yeah, sure. Thanks for the talk. I just wanted to ask. Um, it's more around reaching scale for these things. So first of all, kind of what is scale, and second of all, um, this builds on Rafa's question about identifying pipelines and what the, what is the role do you think of data in scaling this pipeline build up yeah as i mean scale for us um is, is really i mean we, we're looking i what we see now a lot is on in particular on when you talk about natural capital you have investment opportunities in the you know, 10 million and below and i think that's some probably something that's not scalable for large-scale institutional investors you probably have to have investment opportunities more in the hundred millions and investment vehicles more in the billions in order to make this really attractive, but that is there. Um, I think data can play a huge role in the, maybe not necessarily, well in the, it can help really in the assessment on the underlying projects and, and where we really see data and um, third party data, satellite imaging, um, even even to measure the the um, soil moisture contact or even the, maybe in the longer term, even the carbon com um, um, uh, content of, of the um, of the land, and, and I think this is this is one of the key challenges at the moment, right? So if you want to really move to more sustainable practices, the, the, the monitoring and, and and actually having then also the ability to intervene when it's necessary, this is where technology can play a huge role. And I think I think this is this is where the opportunity lies at the moment as well um, to to actually uh, take supply that. And there's a lot of work ongoing on that. It's actually really interesting. There are lots of new data providers that are, that are coming for their AI solutions, there are, there are the systems that are being developed at the moment. Um, the, again, with so many things, there's no one standard. There's also not one kind of agriculture standard like we have it in forestry with FSC. So this, those are all things that need to develop, but um, I'm quite hopeful that uh, with, with all the kind of movement that you see in the industry that this, this will be developed. Okay, thank you. And David, I think you have the last question. Yeah, thanks, Martin, for your time. Just a quick one. Uh, what is your forecast on carbon price by 2030? Well, I, I hope that um, there's, uh, there is one carbon price, maybe. That's, that, will be, that will be already success, right? Because I think it's uh, the, when, when you look at forecast, it depends really what, 
I mean, what type of price do you do you look at, right? And in, in the, the EU ETS price is very different from a voluntary carbon market, from a Californian system to an, to a New Zealand emissions trading scheme. I think what what I would would predict is that you will see more pressure on carbon pricing, and that more governments will use carbon pricing or taxes, which could then also have a push in on on, on some of the other um, trading schemes, so that 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 carbon will be more priced in, and that should then ultimately lead to an increase. But by how much? I mean, this is this is I think everybody's guess at the moment, right? It's, it's very difficult to progress. And I think the other thing you should never forget is that all we've seen um, with the carbon pricing, one of the key challenges is, is everybody says like, what is the one carbon price? But you also see huge volatility in that, right? So, and and, and I think that's that's one thing you have just off, you know, it's, it, depending on how the systems are designed, um, they can be quite sensitive to, 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 to small changes in regulatory regimes or demand and supply balances. And, uh, and so it depends also how those, those regimes are designed when you, for example, look at the EUTS, which was basically trading in, in very, very low single digits. And now because they, after years and years of discussion found a way to actually make it um, and more stringent now we really see now how, how, how massively increased it but it, it took a long time right to do it so so you can have even though there is in theory a lot of demand uh, for for carbon you can have low carbon prices depending on how it's structured and I think that makes the prediction just just very difficult but overall I said I, I would think that more governments will look into finding ways to price carbon because that's the easiest way um, to 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 address this issue how do you manage that risk of um, not being really sure where the carbon price is going and, yeah. and the volatility of it? Yeah, and, and so for, for us, I think the, the way we want to do it is really by, by investing early in projects. So the moment you, you're, you're in early in a project and, and you can at least to some extent, um, let's say, buy at production cost, that's probably your best price. Um, um, your, your, your best price protection and then to combine that with the highest quality. I think if you have the two of them, then you have the best chances. There's no guarantee, but I think that's, that's, your, that's your best chances and that's what we are recommending the clients, right? You focus not, don't focus on the, the, the credits Casper mentioned that you can buy for, I don't know, 50 cents or something. Um, maybe it's worth to spending actually a little bit more now on high quality credits, help them to be generated. Um, but then also have a um, higher regulatory optionality and be still compared to, let's say, to the moment where you would buy them just on when, when, they're, when they're generated, you still get a lower price. So I think that's, that's probably the, the only way you, in my mind you can do it now. Okay, thank you. Hey, thank you, Martin. Uh, thank you for coming today. And for all the questions. So for the rest, we'll be uploading the recording uh, soon. We'll send you the details. And the next speaker next Tuesday uh, is soon to be confirmed. Perfect. Thank you very much for having me. Nice to meet you all. Yeah, same here. All right. Thank Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.